reaching out to, to those people uh, who are in need. Um, so it requires a lot of uh, prayers and just your spiritual support and even emotional support. So if you can, please pray for them and uh, just encourage them as they continue to prepare for the trip. And actually, it's coming up very soon, next week. So, uh, actually, can I just pray for them real quick? What day exactly is it? 16th, okay. Wow, so let's pray. Father, I just want to thank you for giving us the, the, this, this opportunity to go to Myanmar and to serve the people there. And um, God, there are just so many logistical things. We don't even know that the, the custom will let us through with all this medicine, with all these pills, and I don't know, uh, medical uh, equipment, Father. But we know that you're in control. We know that you're sovereign. And so I just pray, God, that you will help us to rely on you and trust you, Lord God, in all the things that we're doing. And uh, I pray that you bless this trip, that uh, the people of Myanmar will, will be blessed, and even our people will be blessed as well. And I pray that you will just do mighty works, Lord God, through the hands of those people who are going. We thank you, Lord. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, so, Joe has talked about this last time. This is actually, we're looking at Luke chapter 11, 12, around this area right now. And uh, this is a time where the Pharisees begin to really dislike Jesus. And you can see that in, in this passage especially. And so, but I guess before I go any further, just let me read the text, and then we'll, we'll go from there. So, Luke chapter 11, verses 37 through 54, that's what we're looking at. Luke 11, 37 through 54, and the title is Master, Masquerader. So now, verse 37. Now when he had spoken, a Pharisee asked him to have lunch with him. And he went in and reclined at the table. When the Pharisee saw it, he was surprised that he had not first ceremonially washed before the meal. But the Lord said to him, Now the Phar you Pharisees claim the outside of the cup and the platter, but inside of you are full of robbery and wickedness. You foolish ones, uh, you foolish ones, did not, did, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But give that which is within as charity, and then all things are clean for you. Verse 42. But woe to you, Pharisees, for you pay tithe, mint, and ruin, and every kind of garden herb, and yet disregard justice and the love of God. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting others. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the chief seats in the synagogues and the respectful greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, for you are like concealed tombs, and the people who walk over them are unaware of it. 45. One of the lawyers said to him in reply, Gee, uh, teacher, when you said this, you insult us too. But he said, Woe to you lawyers as well, for you weigh men down with burdens hard to bear, while you yourself will not even touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets, and it was your fathers who killed them. So you are witnesses and approve the deeds of your fathers, because it was they who killed them, and you build their tombs. For this reason also the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill, some of them they will persecute, so that the blood of all the prophets shed since the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the house of God. Yes, I tell you, it shall be charged against this generation. Woe to you, lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge, you yourselves did not enter, and you hindered those who were entering. Wow. That's pretty harsh. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty crazy. When he left there, the scribes and the Pharisee began to be very hostile to the que to, uh, and to question him closely, closely on many subjects, plotting against him to catch him in something he would say. <laughs> Jesus just basically declared war against the Pharisees and the lawyers or the scribes. I mean, I just I can just sense 
the, the, the tension of this passage right here. I just want to remind you, you know, like in, in verse 37, now when he had spoken, you know, he spoke, he just preached a great sermon and this Pharisee asked him to have lunch with him. And then he went in and had a lunch with him. Even before the menu came, you know, Jesus was like blasting these Pharisees and the, and the lawyers and and he just kept on saying, woe to you guys, woe to you guys, woe to you guys. I mean, lunch hasn't even started yet. <laughs> you know? I mean, did, what did Jesus do afterwards? Can I have the menu, please? Can I order some uh, calamari and, uh, I don't know, some fried fish? I don't know what Jesus did. Did he just <laughs> sit there and have lunch with them? Or did he get kicked out by the Pharisees? Or did he just... We, afterwards, I don't know. The text didn't say, but I just think about it, you know. I just felt like that's really awkward. It's such an intense moment. You know, and it is right here. You can see how the Pharisees begin to dislike. I mean, even kind of from the beginning, but right here is where the war began between the Pharisees and Jesus. You know, so I, this is, it's a very tense passage. So before I go any further, but let me ask you a question. Have you ever felt guilty about, about, about the fact that you're such a good liar? You know, you just lie to somebody and then you thought, man, why, did I, why am I so good at lying? <laughs> and uh, I mean, I felt that way sometimes, you know, when I lie, even though I shouldn't, but I felt that way. But some people might not feel that way. Yeah, yeah, he just lied. That was so apparent, you know. But sometimes you just feel that. You're, you're such a good liar, you know. But you feel guilty about it. And then, you know, have you ever played this game called Sardine? It's like where you, you kind of hide, and then you have this edge trying to find all the people that are hiding. And I remember six years ago, I was interning at Young Timothy Christian Fellowship right here. But we met at 8th and Hunter, you know, from time to time during the we play sardine. And uh, so everybody went hiding. It was dark at night. And uh, there was a closet. And above the closet, there's another section where people put stuff on there, right? And so I thought to myself, nobody is going to find me. If I can climb up there and just lay flat, close the door, nobody's going to find me. And I, I left just a little bit open so it doesn't look suspicious. <laughs> So I went in there, it took me a while to get up there, but I got up there. There, there are no chairs underneath or whatever. And so the it started trying to find people, right? And everybody started finding, I can see people just walking around, like talking and laughing, and they could not find me. And then they're saying, maybe they're up there, or maybe he's up there. But someone else said, no, there's no way, it's too high, there, and it's too small. Nobody can find, nobody can fit into that thing. And I was just like chuckling, laughing up there, right? <laughs> like, ah, ah, ah. You know, but it was really fun. It was really funny. But why did I share that story? Well, it's <laughs> somehow related. <laughs> somehow related in that we all hide. We all try to cover up in, in some area in our lives, you know? And, and we lie because we, we don't want people to find out about certain things, you know? And it's related because there are some problems with hiding. You get tired. I get up there and I stuck in that position for a long time. And I'm a little closer, claustrophobic. And it was not easy for me to stay up there. And so I get really tired and I get lonely. Because everybody's laughing down there and, and they're just walking around trying to find me and they're just hanging out right there. They're just sitting down after a while. But then I'm just lying right there all by myself, being lonely. <laughs> and and I, I have this fear of being exposed, too. Because I don't want anyone to find me. That was the purpose of the game. You, you're supposed to hide. So, but then eventually, you know, you get exposed. You get found. But this is actually where my analogy or illustration breaks down because 
Generally, when we try to hide, when we try to cover up, we feel guilty about it. When I lie to people, when I try to cover up, I just feel guilty. And I feel lonely. I feel tired because if you lie about one thing, oftentimes you have to lie about another. And it just multiplies. It weighs you down. But that's kind of the problem, you know, of, of hiding, of cover up. And what's interesting here is that the Pharisees are the master at doing these kinds. They're master and have covering up. And here Jesus exposed their flaws, their schemes. No wonder why the Pharisees were so, so upset. And so, I mean, I don't know, some of you might, might have seen me uh, post it on Facebook. We're trying to figure out, you know, how, how can we lead an, an authentic life? But then, yet, at the same time, one way or the other, we're all kind of like this Pharisees, that we hide behind, behind some kind of facade, we hide behind some kind of, of uh, a front. So how do we lead an authentic life? And especially in the church, oftentimes people would tell you, man, we don't come to church because the church are full of hypocrites. So what do we do? Are we hypocrites? If we are, then how can we lead an authentic life? This is what we're looking at today. And you know, like, but we're not the only one. Even the world is like this. Have you guys heard this song named Try? It's, it's by Kobe. I don't know how to pronounce her last name, Taylor or something like that. It says, put up, put your makeup on, get your nails done, curl your hair, run an extra mile, keep it slim. So they like you. Do they like you? You know? I mean, that's kind of like the song that kind of play a lot on the radio right now. Mm -hmm. And basically the idea is, do you like yourself? Do people like you? What, what's the point of people liking you if you don't even like yourself? You know, it's just kind of like the idea of being authentic. And we are looking for authenticity. This generation, that's what we're looking for in this generation. And so, I was like, okay, well, maybe I should look it up. What authenticity is? What are they looking for? So I looked it up, and people have all sorts of ideas in terms of what it, meant, what it means to be authentic. And it's so elusive, and it's just like, okay, you have to be not afraid. You have to be vulnerable. You want just to say whatever you want to say, but then it kind of breaks down, you know, because I see some people on Facebook, and they just say whatever they want to say. <laughs> and I'm just like, whoa. You are pretty authentic, yes, but I'd rather you not say anything. <laughs> you know what I mean? So not be afraid of just speaking out. Well, maybe you should. <laughs> you know, I don't know. So again, the idea is very elusive. So, you know, again, none of us are like hypocrites, and let alone, let alone being one. If we're honest with ourselves, we're all masqueraders, one way or the other. And so how can we lead? An authentic lie. Well, I think I believe this passage actually unlocks that mystery. It's kind of cool, actually. This passage actually unlocks that mystery. So let's look at actually let's look at the, look at the woes. Why did Jesus just so angry at the Pharisees? Why was he so angry at the Pharisees? Woe well, number one, verse forty-two. But woe to you, Pharisees! For you pay tithe of mint and root and every kind of garden herb, and yet disregard justice and the love of God, but these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. So they basically picked and chose what they want to follow. They said, oh, okay, the New Testament is, or maybe half of this Bible is too hard to follow. But then the other half is pretty easy, so I'm going to follow the, the, the half that is easy to follow. And so he just disregard, they just disregard the other half. Or something like, well, it's too hard to love my enemy, so I'm just not going to do that. But I'll, I'll pay 10% of, uh, of, of the tithe uh, on Sundays. You know, so, so they pick and choose what they want to do and what they don't want to do. And so basically they've created their own religion. If you actually look down into it, look deeper into it. They created 
their own religion. But Jesus is saying that, Jesus is saying that, hey, you guys couldn't, you guys shouldn't neglect this part of the laws while doing this part. If you want to be a Pharisee, if you want to be followers of me, you got to do all of these things. You can't pick and choose what you think is good for you, or what you think it makes sense, or what you think it's 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 easy. So that's what Jesus is saying. Number one, number one, they basically picked and choose what they want to do rather than what God wanted wanted them to do. And in fact, these are called the weightier provisions, weightier laws, justice, love. Compassion. So second one, second woe, verse 43. It says, Woe well to you Pharisees, for you love the chief seats in the synagogues and the respectful, respectful greetings in the marketplaces. And basically, these, this is saying that they love honor for themselves. They care about their own image. They care about what they can get from the people rather than what God thinks. That's, that's their problem. Instead of giving honor to God, they receive glory for themselves. And so they, they will pray for extra long prayers, or, or they will wear this crazy tassel and, and robe, and, and when they walk down the street from miles away, you can, you can see, okay, that's a Pharisee right there. It's coming, coming into town. You can tell because they puff them up. They raise themselves up so they can be honored. That's one, another, that's one of the woes. But I want you guys to think about this, though. As we go through these woes of these Pharisees, I want you to look, at, look into your own heart. Because oftentimes, that's exactly how I, how I am. I love being greeted respectfully. I love being, you know, honored, and, and I, 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 I love... You know, I mean, it's hard for me to do certain things that, that the Bible says, and it's easier for me to do certain things that the Bible says. I want you guys to think about how you're kind of like a Pharisee. And so, so we just finished the second world, uh, number three. Verse 44, it says, Woe to you, for you are like concealed tombs, and the people who walk over them are unaware of it. I don't know if you guys know, but the... Uh, in the Old Testament, there is a very um, big, strong emphasis on the idea of cleanliness, purity. You're not supposed to touch dead carcasses. You're not supposed to touch certain things because they're considered as unclean. So even the tombs, you're not supposed to touch because if you touch it, you become unclean and you have to do some kind of ceremonial things to uh, cleanse yourself. So that you can go back into the church, to the temple, not the church, the temple or the synagogue, and you can have fellowship with people because that's where the fellowship is at. So if you're unclean, you, should, you shouldn't be there. But these Pharisees, just imagine with me, Jesus calls them the concealed tombs. This reminds me of the zombie movies that I see on TV. <laughs> You know, you have this just tall grass, right? And people are walking through the field. And you don't know where the zombies are because the, the, the grass is so tall. And then they're just lying around. And as, as you pass by, they just grab you. You know, and then you're like, whoa, and then you shoot them. <laughs> That's what it kind of reminds me of. It's kind of like a zombie hiding, waiting for their prey. But this is worse because... This kind of still took for us to touch it would become unclean, but we don't know we're unclean. So if we just continue to, to interact with people, talk to people, what's going to happen? The entire nation will become unclean in a matter of days. But Jesus is saying that you guys are like these concealed tombs. You are causing people to sin. You are causing people to, to uh, become unclean and impure. That's a very strong accusation towards the Pharisees. These are hard sayings. In verse 46, the fourth woe. Let's keep going. 
But he said, oh, okay, verse 45, one of the lawyers said to him, he replied, teacher, when you say this, you insult us too. So, well, now that you mentioned, <laughs> you know, verse 46, woe to you lawyers as well. For you weigh men down with burdens hard to bear, while you yourself would not even touch the burdens with one of your fingers. And so basically Jesus is saying that you guys create all these unnecessary laws and stipulations and, and whatever, and you're causing, you're bearing, and you're putting all this burden on people because they cannot bear it. It's too much. It's unnecessary. And what's even worse is that they don't even bother to follow what they have created. So they'll say something and then they will create something else to, ne uh, to kind of negate what they have created. So if you don't know the laws, if you don't know the Mosaic law very well, if you're not, if you're not like the scribes, you have to follow every single one of the laws that it's been prescribed according to the experts of the law. But they themselves don't do anything. Because they just, they find these loopholes, right? But that's another problem. And, verse, and, and then verse 47, it's the fifth woe. For verse 47, woe to you, for you built the tombs of the prophets, and it was your fathers who killed them. So you are witnesses, and to prove the deeds of your fathers, because it was they who killed them. And you built their tombs. For this reason, for, for, and also the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill, some of them they will persecute. So the blood of all the prophets and shed since the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the house of God. Yes, I tell you, it will be charged against this generation. I don't know what this meant, honestly. It was so long. I looked at the commentaries and it didn't make sense. Whatever they said, I didn't really agree with them. So... I'm going to skip it. <laughs> but actually, I'll come back to it because I think there is a reason that Jesus said this. Even though I don't exactly know what he's talking about just yet, we'll come back to it. Well, six. This is, I believe this is actually why Jesus is so upset, so angry at the Pharisees. So much so that he was willing to to just lay it down, right here, right now. Verse 52, Woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You yourselves did not enter, and you hindered those who were entered. <coughs> so they're supposed to be called for, they're, they're supposed to be the priests for the nations. They're supposed to be the link between the people and God. They have the, the access to God. They're supposed to be the access to God for the people. But now, because of who they are, because of the, what they have done, or what they have not done, they literally threw away the key that, you can, that, that, that is used to enter into the kingdom of God. They just threw it away. They themselves cannot go in there. Other people try to find a way. Couldn't. That's a very, again, that's a very strong accusation. So basically, if you sum it all up, the Pharisees and the lawyers, they, they, they love honor for themselves. They don't care, they don't really care about God. They picked and choose what they wanted to do. And then they weigh people down with the laws and say, they basically said, look at you guys. We're better because we're keeping all the laws, while none of you are keeping the laws. But Jesus saw through their scheme, and he just basically summed it all up. You guys are hypocrites. In verse uh, chapter 12, verse 1, you guys don't have it, but I can just read it for us. He began to say to his disciples, first of all, be aware of leavens of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. He summed, summed it all up for, 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 for the disciples, for us. If you don't know what the text is saying, just look a little further. It's all about hypocrisy. So uh, the church oftentimes are acting like the Pharisees. I 
know. Because oftentimes I act like one. But yet at the same time, again, we're trying to think of, we're trying to figure out the question, the answer to the question of how can we live an authentic life? Even though one way or the other, we have this tendency to, to be like the Pharisees, the tendency to, to, to be hypocritical. I didn't ask for permission, but I, I hope you don't mind me sharing this. But there, there, there's one time, a friend of mine, there's like a two people knocking on the door, and then they're, the, and it, they're the energy providers, but they kind of hit themselves and they say that, we're here to tell you that, um, that your energy provider is overcharging you. Let me see your, your paper. And then uh, they will tell you all this, this, this unnecessary charges that you, you that the energy provider is charging you. And uh, after a while, they will say, well, actually, we're coming from like, another en energy provider. And so I have a better deal for you. And so, and so they, you know, it's really easy to say, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. Thank you so much for pointing this out. Here's my information and just change my, my energy provider. And I feel like that's kind of like the Pharisees is doing. It. It's like a switch of bait, you know? And so, again, the idea of this uh, unattainable stand standards that we're just pointing fingers at each other. We're saying that you guys are hypocrites. We're pointing to the world. That you, are, you guys are hypocrites. And the world are pointing at us. You guys are hypocrites. And we're just like, yeah, we all are hypocrites. So what does authenticity mean? When I look at a line, trying to understand what authenticity means, basically it boils down to being yourself. That's kind of what it boils down to, being yourself. But I find that having, I mean, that's a lot of problems. It is very problematic in a way it sums it down to it. So for me, I think authenticity when you have true authenticity is when you realize it's not about you. You have true authenticity when you realize it's not about you. Because when you pursue that answer, that the question to that the answer to that question, when it comes down to it, it's all about your own personal image. About how people perceive you or how you perceive yourself. It's all about you. But that's, that's the problem. That's the wrong question that we're seeking, that we're trying to answer. How can you be authentic when you realize it's not about you? And you can tell, you can see it from this passage. Let me show you where it is. In verse 40, Jesus says, You foolish ones! Did he not make the outside, made the inside also? But give that which is within as charity, and then all things are clean for you. So what Jesus is saying that if you are willing to give, if you're willing to, to reach out to people compassionately, out of compassion, out of love, you serve people, then everything will be clean for you. You don't have to worry about what other people are thinking of, uh, thinking about you. You don't have to think about how you think of you. Just love. Just care. That's what Jesus is saying. Instead of worrying about receiving honor for yourself, just serve. Lay down your honor, lay down your pride, lay down your glory. Just Sir, that's what Jesus is saying. And, and the second one, verse 42, But woe to you Pharisees, for you pay tithe and men and ruin every kind of garden herb, and yet disregard justice and the love of God. So, uphold justice. Uphold justice. When you see somebody's poor, when you see somebody... When you see some kind of injustice is being done to a society, to a, a certain group of people or a certain person, Jesus is saying that. Stand up for that. 
Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. That's what Jesus is saying. And, and then the other one is, out of your love for God. The motivation is, is again, is love. Out of your love for God, love your neighbor. Uphold justice. Get rid of injustice in your life and in the society. That's what Jesus is talking about. And, and just imagine with me that you have somebody who does that. Imagine with me that, that you see a person who, who loves his neighbor, even his enemies. He loves justice and he just helps all those people who are in need. And he loves God. When you see that person, you will say, wow, that's an authentic person. Because he, he speaks out against injustice. He, he's not afraid. He's being himself. And he loves God. He does what is right. So for other people, they see this person and say, wow, that's an authentic person. But for this person, that is not his goal, to be authentic. His goal is to love, to uphold justice. So asking that question, how to lead an authentic life, is not really the right question to ask. But yet, you could have an authentic life if you would do these things, just love one another, love God. And if you're worried about being hypocrites, don't worry about it. Just love. Because if you are able to do that, you will aspire to be somebody who you want to be. And even though you lie, you're, you're a great liar, I mean, you are just so good at it, whatever, when it, when it comes down to it, it doesn't really matter. If you just continue to love, if, if you just fix your eyes on that idea, if you just fix your eyes on that thought, Forget everything else. Forget about being authentic. Forget about, you know, that you want, you, you want to stop being a, a hypocrite. Just love. That's what Jesus said. And Jesus, we know Jesus. He, he's not going to tell. We know God. We, he, he's not going to tell us to do something that, that he himself doesn't do. Jesus, God, out of charity, out of compassion, out of love, he came down to this earth. For God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son so that whoever shall believe in Him would not perish but have eternal life. And again, we, we know the, the Luke chapter 4, I, I know I always refer to this. You know, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, Jesus speaking, because He anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recap, recovery of sight to the blind and set free those who are oppressed. And Jesus himself came to do that. To uphold justice and to love those who are in need. Who are oppressed. Who are depressed. And Jesus came because he loved God the Father. And so for all for us Christians, we understand, yeah, we need to love God the Father. We need to use that as, as motivations to, to, to propel us forward. And for those of you who are not Christians, you might be saying to yourself, well, I don't know who God is. How can I love this God? How can I love somebody that's invisible? How can I love this person who, cannot, who I cannot communicate? But God is actually closer to you, much, much closer to you than you could ever, ever imagine. Sometimes it's a little too close that you might feel a little uncomfortable, actually, because how close he is to you. 2,000 years ago, Jesus came. He came to explain who God is. And he came to explain that we all have the problem of hypocrisy. We're all hypocrites one way or the other. And and basically, we all have problems in that we do not love God. We don't have a relationship with God. We are all blocked from the kingdom of God. And Jesus came to open, to kick that door open 
for you guys, for us, so that we can enter in to that door, through that door, into the kingdom of God. And the only, I guess, stipulation, requirement, is that you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and He died on the cross for you and, and, and God raised Him from the dead. Jesus, He Himself came to do all these things so that He, that, that he can be an example for us to follow. Again, there's no need. There's no need to, to answer the question of how can I be authentic? The question that you need to ask is, have I loved? And authenticity will come afterwards. There's, I mean, in this uh, day and age, technology is just everywhere. Passwords is, is what kind of what we use to, to authenticate who we are oftentimes. You know, when you log on to the bank, when you use an app, when you use an iPhone, you oftentimes have to type in this, this username and password, right, in order to authenticate who you are. And uh, what if somebody comes in, got your password, got your username, and went into your bank account, Chase bank account, and that's what I have, and uh, began to withdraw large, large sum of money. I mean, somebody could do that, right? If they find out what your password is, what your username is, sometimes people's password is password, you know, so it's not <laughs> really hard to crack for some people what the passwords are. And then they'll just write it down, post it notes, and then just change the bank account, username, password, you know. <laughs> some people do that, my dad does that. <laughs> well, I will tell you where my dad, my dad is. <laughs> Maybe I just tell my dad not to do that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, but, however, that's, we know, that's not a very, the best way to do it. Just have a pass, username and password. So, so the system, the, the, these IT people will come up with, come, came up with these ideas in that there is a, a method to detect masqueraders. So you can actually log in with my username and password into my Chase account but the system can actually still detect who you actually are. And uh, the way they do that is study your normal behavior. Ever since you log in, ever since you created an account, it begins to study your daily routines. You know, for me, I check my balances all the time, and I withdraw, I withdraw a certain amount of money, I never withdraw a large sum of money or withdraw a little amount of money at one time in a short period of time. You know, so it studies your behavior. And so when an intruder comes in, when a, a masquerader comes in, there's a malady, uh, some, some kind of, something that, that they can flag. And they'll say, they'll close the account or they will suspend it. So why do I mention this? The mention of this, mention this is, is that we all have some kind of behavior. But motivations drives our behavior. For me, I just want to check balances. But for some people, it's to withdraw as much money as possible. And through this, they can detect, okay, looking at these behaviors, this is a, an authentic user. Looking at this set of behaviors, these are not authentic users. So if you <laughs> identify yourself as Christian, if you identify yourself as Christians, then your identity is actually authenticated by your love for others. It's not necessarily about so much about what you do or what you don't do. Your identity is authenticated by your love for others. And it comes from within. <laughs> oh, sometimes you can't see that as behavior. But your motivation drives your behavior. So if your outward appearances and, and your inward identities are not compatible, that's obvious that you're acting like hypocrites. And so, again, 
you identify, you're, if you identify yourself as Christians, then your identity is authenticated by your love for one another. And I have really one simple application. For all these things that I have said, that we have talked about, I have one simple application. And it comes in the form of a question. What? What breaks your heart? What breaks your heart? When you look around this world, when you look around uh, your neighborhood, your friends, what breaks your heart? I'm not necessarily asking you guys to quit your job. Sometimes, you know, like things that, you, that break your heart is just so daunting, so big that you just feel like there's no way I could do anything about that. But I'm not necessarily, necessarily saying that you need to just change all, all your, your behaviors, to quit your job and go to a third world country. That might be what it is, but many of us are not in a position to do that. But what can you do in your surroundings to love, to uphold justice, to show the love of God, to honor God and give glory to God. What breaks your heart? And I want you guys to think about that question. I want you guys to come up with an answer or answer to that question this week. And if you could come up with anything, you know, you can always help the church. There are plenty of things that you could do. And we're all about helping people to come in to come to the Lord to, to know who God is and to experience the love of God. So if you don't have anything that really s sticks out to you in terms of it probably breaks your heart, well, come serve the church. Come serve God through the church. Come serve the people through the church. So ask yourself that question. What breaks your heart? So I'm going to end with a prayer. And for those of you who, like I said, do not know who Jesus is, God, <laughs> Jesus loves you. He came and died on the cross for you. He himself exemplified what he taught. For your sins, he came and died. Romans 10, 9. You confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So if you do not know who Jesus is, I encourage you to approach me, one of the leaders here, and be, just start talking about what that means to be a Christian. So I know I, know I took a lot of time already, but I'm going to pray. Actually, I, I won't pray. I actually have uh, somebody to come up to share a testimony for us. And then he's going to come up, and then once he's done uh, sharing, I'll come up and pray, closing prayer for us. So now we have Aaron, Aaron Bain, or Bob. Uh, 